And this morning we're going to be looking at another one that we found in Matthew chapter 25. As we look at life, there is a very common statement that has been made, or we have been the recipient of it. And the statement is simply three words. Are you ready? Well, sometimes you're going to go to an event and you find family members kind of straggling behind and they're not quite there yet. And so you have said to them, are you ready? Some of you will be saying that in the next couple weeks a little more frequently as your children start back to school. And there will be a yellow uh, bus coming down the street and you're saying to the kids, are you ready yet? Because the bus is coming and you're going to be late if you don't get there. One day, I was reading one of these advice columns in the newspaper, and I find this rather hard to believe, but I'm sure it's gospel because it was in the sun. <laughs> but this guy was asking advice because um, his wife was rather slow in getting ready. In fact, he said that every time she went out, she needed an hour and a half, that's 90 minutes, to apply her makeup, get her hair ready, and have the proper attire so that everything matched. That was for every single time, he said, that she left the house. And he was rather weary of asking her, are you ready? And so he wanted to know what he should do. In Matthew 25, we have this amazing parable that Jesus told about ten women. They're called the wise and the foolish bridesmaids. And it really is a parable about being prepared and being ready for the coming of the Lord. Now that is a topic that is often not discussed today. It seems to have been forgotten by many, and we don't give it a great amount of consideration. When we look at this theme of are you ready, we look at the very first coming of Jesus, and the world was not really ready for when he was going to come the first time. Yet if you look at the Old Testament, the coming of the Messiah was something that was clearly predicted and prophesied for hundreds and hundreds of years. A lot of data was known about the coming of the Messiah, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be of the lineage of David, the greatest king of Israel. It was also prophesied that he would minister in the region of Galilee and that he would do great and wonderful things for the people. And so, the world, though it knew about the coming, was not ready for the very first time. And so when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there was a group of magi, or wise men, who came from the east, probably from Persia in modern day. And they had seen this heavenly sign, and they followed this sign for almost two years. And they came to the place, and they went to the religious leaders, and they said, we have been following this sign. It seems to indicate the birth of someone really important or significant, is this the Messiah? And they said, oh yeah, these are the signs. And they got the scriptures and said, and this is where he will be residing and this is what he is going to do. And though they knew all about this and the sign was right there on the doorstep, they never went and did anything about it. They never went to worship the Christ child. And these seekers from a distant land were the ones who actually went and found the Christ child. We also discover that when Jesus began to minister in his three years of ministry, that he came to his own hometown. And it said that his own people would not even receive him. Some said, oh, this is just the son of Mary. This is the carpenter who has been working in the village. And we are told that Jesus could do no great work in his own hometown because of the lack of faith in the people. They were not willing to receive him. And so the question that we have to ask is this, as we look at this parable this morning, 
Are you ready? Do you live in any sense of expectation that the Lord Jesus is going to come again to rule and to reign forever and forever? Or is it just a theological concept that you might have, but it does not impact or affect how we live day to day? So we need to understand as we begin looking at this parable this morning that there is a promise. And the promise that is given to us is that Jesus will come again. So Jesus, we know, lived historically on the earth 33 years. Three years of his life was spent in ministry. He was arrested, he was convicted, he was crucified, and then three days later he rose bodily from the grave and he remained on earth for a period of 40 years and then he was caught up into heaven. And this is what we read. As Jesus ascended to heaven, two angels said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? He's speaking to the people gathered around. Now notice this. This same Jesus who has been taken from you will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And that was the promise that was given to us 2,000 years ago. And we are still waiting for his coming again. And the church has lived with that hope, that expectation, and that certainty that in God's timing, this is going to take place. But if we're really honest, because it's been 2,000 years, there have been a lot of people who have speculated when this is going to happen. You know, some people thought, oh, it must be 1984, because of uh, Orson Welles' is a great prophecy. They didn't remember that great event called Y2K? There was a book written, I won't tell you the, the author or the church that it's associated with, because some of you will catch on quickly. But it was written in 1989. And, uh, <clears throat> no, sorry, it was written in 1988. In 1988, it said, the title was the book, was 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. On New Year's Day, 1989, the book was on sale for half price. <laughs> and uh, no wonder what is taking place. And so lots of people have speculated. There was a pastor in a Korean, uh, I would not say church, but more like a cult, who encouraged a number of years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, a lot of his followers that the Lord was going to come, they were to sell everything that they owned, and they gathered together on a mountain waiting for this momentous event, and it passed. He was actually charged by the government and spent time in prison for defrauding the people because after the event didn't happen, they had given away everything. They were left impoverished. So what does the Bible say about the coming of Jesus? Well, we know that there is lots of speculation that will take place. And the reason we read Matthew 24 first is to kind of set the grounding for this parable that Jesus would teach. So Jesus is walking around, and he sees the temple, and he says to his followers, you see this? Not one stone will be left standing on the other. And they're thinking, this must be the second coming. And as you begin to read it, there's all kinds of signs. And he said, this generation will not pass away before these things have taken place. And what he was referring to was the destruction of the temple, which we know historically took place in 70 AD. And literally, one stone was not left standing on the ground. But then he says, of that day and that hour, which is in reference to the return of the Lord, he makes this statement. And what he says, of that day no one knows. Not the angels of God, not even Jesus in his incarnation, living as a human on earth, knows at that point in time. But only the Father knows. Only the Father knows. And so... He goes on to say a few other things. He said, life is just going to continue before the Lord returns. It will be as in the days of Noah. And so Noah was given a warning by God 
that, his, that destruction was going to take place. And he was to build this massive ark. And can you imagine all the neighbors thinking, who's this crazy guy? He's building this boat, and it's huge, and it's not even near a body of water. And it took years and years and years to build this thing. And eventually, the flood occurred. But in the meantime, what happened? Life just went on. People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And that's what the Lord says. Life will continue as per normal. And so for 2,000 years, life has been moving on, hasn't it? People have been marrying and giving in marriage. People have come. People have died. Generations have come. Generations have gone. We live life in the norm. But a lot of people ignore what God is saying. And the key concept in Matthew 24 is found in two words. And the two words are simply this. Keep watch. Keep watch. Know that it is going to happen. And so he goes on and tells another story. He said, suppose there's an owner of the house. And they hear that someone is going to rob their house. What do they do? Well, if you're the owner of the house, I'm sure you're going to lock the doors, set the alarm. But if they say, you know what, we know for sure there's going to be a robber at your house tonight, I would have the OPP sitting inside waiting right? So I know that something is going to happen. But most of us don't know what's going to happen, so we just take normal precautions. Most nights we lock the door, turn off the lights. Some people might set an alarm with whatever is going to be. But the question is, are you ready for the unexpected to happen? Because the unexpected is going to become a reality. And so Jesus says, that's why you need to be ready. You need to be ready that I can come at any time. And so he tells this amazing little parable. And this parable is about a wedding. Now, we all love weddings. They're fun to go to. They have great celebrations and all kinds of events. And a Middle Eastern wedding in the time of Jesus was an event of great joy and of great celebration. But we need to understand, most of our weddings last a day. It takes a year and a half to plan it, but it lasts for a day. In a Middle Eastern wedding, the festivities often would last for an entire week. And so there would be parties and celebrations, and there was pageantry, and there was drama, which was all part of their tradition. And in this story, the bride has ten friends that she has invited to be part of her wedding procession. They are the bridesmaids. And part of their responsibility is to follow this great drama and tradition of accompanying the bride and the bridegroom to their new home. Now, often they would do that in the middle of the night. And everybody knew that. It was part of their tradition. So if you're going to travel at night, you need to have a lamp. You don't want to trip and fall and hurt yourself so they would have a torch that they would carry as they went to the house. But here's the, uh, the secret. The timing of the event was never known. People didn't know exactly when it was going to happen. They didn't say, okay, at 2.30 we have a wedding planner who will be at the door and they're going to get you out and we're going to go. It never happened that way. It was always to be a surprise. And so the bridesmaids knew that and they were to be waiting expectantly that sometime during this week, this event was going to unfold. And it was the joy of the groom to try to catch them sleeping. That was part of the drama that was going to unfold. And so when the groom decided, okay, it's time for this part of the festivities, a runner would be sent out and announce that the groom was coming and everyone was getting ready. Now, at the conclusion of this story, we read that all ten were sleeping because it's the middle of the night. Five of them were not prepared because they didn't have enough oil. It had run out. They had not anticipated that it would be such a long wait before the groom actually came. When you think about this, it's really tragic 
to miss an event that you have waited for so long. Now, of these ten women, five of them had brought extra oil. And the other five were not able to borrow from them because there would not be enough to go around. So the five who have not brought the extra oil are told, well, go and purchase some more. Well, where do you buy oil in the middle of the night? They're going to have to scramble and find who can give them extra oil. And so they have to go and do that. Then when they return, they find that the door of the house where the celebration is going on is closed shut. And according to the custom, once the door was shut, it was never to be opened again. Here's the bottom line. They were too late. Too late. Now, in this parable, Jesus identifies himself as the bridegroom. Israel is the bride. Followers of Jesus today are the spiritual children of God. We are the spiritual Israel of God. And Israel was not prepared for the first event. And sadly, probably many are not prepared for the second coming or the second advent. The question Jesus asks today is this. Are my followers, are my disciples alert and ready for my coming? And so this is the question that all of us have to think about this morning. Are you ready? Are you living in anticipation that the Lord can come at any time? Do you live each day in that state of readiness and expectation? Are you prepared at any moment to stand before God in all of his glory? Whether it is at the time of the second coming, if we are alive, when the Lord returns, or at the moment of our death, when none of us know will, will occur, are you prepared to stand before the face of God? So the question is this. How can I be ready? Well, to be ready, let me suggest the first thing is this. We need to have a relationship with the bridegroom. As you know the bridegroom, you become aware of his presence in your life. You become aware of his interventions in your life. And the five foolish women ought to have utilized their previous experiences, as well as their knowledge, so that they could have been prepared for the coming of the bridegroom. They probably needed to know, we don't know when he's going to come. We will need to have extra oil. We just have to be prepared. And so as we think of the coming of the Lord, it's been 2,000 years since that declaration was made. As you have seen Jesus go, so he will come again. And we're thinking, really? This is so long. When is it going to happen? We need to understand it will happen in God's perfect timing. In the first coming, it was prophesied for centuries and centuries that the Messiah would come. Listen to what Peter says in his epistle. He says these words. Where is his coming? But do not forget one thing. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. But the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. What's his promise? He will come again. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And so in God's perfect timing, the coming will take place. You see, in this little parable, only knowledge of the bridegroom prepared these five young women for the coming of the bridegroom. And as we live each day in a living relationship with Jesus, we will be prepared for his final coming. Whether it is at the end of the age or if it's in a moment of time when he calls you home through the door of death. But the second thing, apart from having a relationship with the bridegroom, is we need to understand this. You can't 
borrow preparation from someone else. We have to be prepared ourselves. So there was this announcement. The groom is coming. And the five who didn't take enough oil, they tried to borrow from the other five who were with them. But there was not enough. And we discover that this was the response that they said, give us some oil. And the other women said, no, because there will not be enough for all of us. Now, when you read that, you might think, oh, those five were just totally insensitive. They should have shared some of their oil. It wouldn't have been enough, so all ten would never have gotten into the wedding party. Though it seems to be insensitive, it is a reality around the crisis of life. I was thinking about this, and I heard a statement years ago, which I've thought about many, many times, and it says this. It's too late to get prepared in the midst of a crisis. Now, the Americans on the, uh, Texas just had an incredible storm going through. And there was all kinds of preparation for people evacuating. I read they evacuated thousands of prisoners, even from the jails and uh, penitentiaries, because they were in the line of this terrible storm. And they removed them to safety. It's a little bit late in the midst of the storm to think, well, what should we do? Years ago in New York City, some of you will remember this, there was a massive blackout of the entire city. It was a very hot summer, not quite like this summer, but maybe like last summer, when we had all those days of plus 95 Fahrenheit. Air conditionings were running 24-7, and a lot of power was being consumed. And then they had this incredible thunderstorm, and it knocked out the main power lines of the city. The real problem for these New Yorkers was that they could not borrow enough power from other places, including Canada. And Time Magazine wrote a front page story and they entitled it, Why the Lights Went Out. In essence, they were not prepared for the reality that could happen. Some of you are going to be going back to school in a couple of weeks. And following that, there will be another period during the semester where they call examination time. Let me tell you this. It's going to come. Be forewarned. But here's the other kicker. You can't borrow somebody else's preparation. You can't borrow someone else's preparation. I remember when I was in high school, we had to write these departmental exams set by the provincial government. And some of the exams were really, really tough. And every student in the entire province of Ontario had to take the exam at the exact same time. And during that exam period, they would bring in a folder and it was sealed. And a student and a teacher had to witness that the seal had not been broken and the papers were taken out and handed to the students. And you wrote them and you had a time frame, had to be handed in, sealed up again, and sent away. I remember one of my high school friends, probably not the brightest light in the chandelier, um, knew that he was going to have a tough time. But he had, it was before we did it on computers, he had a chest full of pens. And they were those advertising pens that you could take the advertising out, and he would slip in there little pieces of paper with cheat notes because he wasn't prepared. But he put a couple of dummy pens in there because he was smart. And sure enough, and I knew what he was doing because he would every so often he'd take out the pen, take it apart, and pull it, and he'd have the answer and write it down. The teacher came by, took a pen, looked at it, and decided to unscrew it. And sure enough, it was one of the fake pens he put in there. There was nothing wrong with it. He had the real good ones in other pockets, and he left a couple of these out on the desk. You can't borrow someone else's preparation because if you do, you're probably going to get into serious trouble. And so the same is true with us in our relationship with God. You can't borrow someone else's relationship with God if you're going to be prepared to stand before the face of God. And the third thing is this. When the opportunity is passed, 
it's too late. It's too late. There's a really sad ending to this parable, as many of us would read it. So these five women go. Somehow they get the extra oil. They return, and look what happens. The door is closed. They knock and they knock. But the, the uh, person says, I don't know you. And that was the custom. The door was locked so that people who were just hanger oners wanted to get in at the last minute, maybe not even part of the wedding party, were barred from entering in. So we need to understand that the opportunity to enter into the kingdom of God is past, and it's too late when the door is shut. Jesus offers to us eternal life. And if we resist his gift of eternal life, we cannot enter into this relationship with God forever. If you, cannot, if you and if I continually say no to God in this life, ultimately the door will be shut. And we need to understand this. There are no second chances after death. On the other hand, it's never too late. For as long as we have life, the invitation of God is this, come to the wedding. But we need to understand that we need to do this now. The writer of Ecclesiastes also says these words. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Remember him before the silver cord is severed, the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring, and the dust returns to the ground from where it came, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. It's a very eloquent way to speak about life and death. He says, remember your creator from the days of your youth. Remember him before the silver cord is severed. Many believe that's just an eloquent way of saying before you suffer a massive stroke that can lead to death. Or the pitcher is shattered at the spring. In other words, you suffer a heart attack and you die. And the body returns to the ground, but the spirit returns to God. So God's question to us is this. Are you ready? Are you ready this morning for when the Lord returns or for when he calls you to himself? It's really important that you settle that issue once for all because when you have settled it, then you can live life to the full. You don't have to worry about it because you are choosing to live every day with Jesus at the center of your life. You're living with that knowledge and anticipation of his involvement in your life, not only day by day, but that one day he shall come and call you to himself. So how do you do this? How do you settle this once for all? Let me suggest a couple things. To be received by God, first and foremost, we must receive him. So we invite him to come to be in our life, to be the center of our life, that we surrender our life unto him, to ask him to be the forgiver of all of our past and the one who gives us life that is abundant. And then... Doing that, we make a choice day after day after day that we want to seek to live in the presence of God. God, make me sensitive and aware of your presence. There's a great prayer that the Apostle Paul encourages us to do, that we pray that we would be filled with the Spirit of God over and over again, day after day. And when you do that, when you're living in the presence of God day by day, then you will know that you are ready. You are ready for the coming of the bridegroom because you're living in his presence right now. And when he comes, when no one knows the day nor the hour, you will be ready. And you will celebrate at the wedding feast. Are you ready? If you're not, I would invite you this morning just to pray this prayer. Lord, here is my life. Here it is, just as I am. I ask you to come 
to be the sender of my life, to be the forgiver of my past, and help me to live with an awareness of your presence day by day, that I will seek to live in such a way that I will honor you and love you with my whole heart. Let's pray together.